this week's been about grounding. It's been about kind of recentering with the things that we do all the time and using the grounding as just a reminder of what's important. So I'm gonna get that one started and then see where this one weighs in. We definitely are using the bowl to its absolute max. I have a team member, he's super ambitious, he's only 18 years old and really likes to push the limits on everything he does. And so he's my other mixer primarily. And I have dubbed this mode where things start spilling out of the bowl if you're not careful as Logie mode. His name is Logan. And so now we have, we actually have in our most recent training manuals, Logie mode called out. Um, so this last flour, this is a, um, this is an organic high gluten flour that I'm adding alongside our custom blend from our local stone mill. This is, this just proof blend. Uh, it's a mixture of local grains. This high gluten organic flour that I'm about to add, high gluten needs to be clarified here for all of you who are worried about that. What does that mean? It just means it's a high protein flour. It means when I add this flour in, it's going to add dough strength. It's uh, protein in flour is actually, so gluten is actually just the protein that, that, uh, that, that binds when flour and water come together. And so a flour that has a natural high protein just develops better dough strength. And so this flour helps us just round out the strength of our dough. Uh, because the bowl is super full, if I add it now, it's gonna start kicking back. But what I can simply do is change the directionality of this bowl and it will change the way in which it mixes in. So uh, when the bowl is spinning clockwise, right? Yes, clockwise. Uh, the, it's faster to incorporate, but it's also kind of pushing everything out to the edges. When the bowl is spinning counterclockwise, it's actually pushing ingredients into the middle. And so when I have a really full mix, I'm going to go that ladder route so that this last bit of flour that I'm trying to get in uh, ends up in the middle. I know that this this mixer can take it. Uh, it's an old Hobart, and if you haven't heard this story, I ended up picking it up on at basically where this type of equipment goes to die, like a, a junkyard in California. I drove out with my original broken box truck. It was one of the last trips that that truck took. Actually, shortly after that trip, I was driving one day, and the the, where the coolant is stored, that whole tank just exploded one day while I was driving. This was like an old auction vehicle that we got. Uh, but before it went kaput, it helped me get this guy from California. And you can get a mixer like this from an equipment junkyard really cheap. This mixer cost me $1,200. And the only thing that was wrong with it was, well, I think a lot of people would have been intimidated. All these buttons didn't work. The whole like electrical board was fried. And so we ended up replacing these buttons with just, like this is a basic switch that you can find at Granger. Just a basic on off switch. Uh, we found this switch at Granger and we found this and replaced these three things. We could never figure out how to get the second speed to go, but that's okay. We run this in first speed. And this mixer really changed our world when we got it. Um, you know, prior to this, which was only, I don't think people quite realize, at this point, we've only had this mixer for two years. So prior to two years, everything in here is hand mixed. Uh, we did have this one for six months longer. Uh, and we were starting to mix in this one quite regularly, but given that, that the max load in loaves is only 40 loaves, 
this one wasn't all that useful on its own for our particular scale. Uh, I think I've said this before and I'll say it again, if you are in the process of building out a bakery, be careful what you buy. I think a lot of people would be tempted to buy a 20 quart mixer and these things aren't cheap, brand new. Brand new, these things are still five or six thousand uh, dollars. Actually used, I bought this one on auction for more. It was like fourteen hundred, versus this one that I bought on auction for eight hundred, versus this one that I bought on auction for twelve hundred. So by the time the equipment is used, it loses a lot of its value, but it holds some base value, and there's really no difference in the base value that the market can bear on an auction between a 20 quart and the bigger ones mainly because there's less people that need a mixer this size and even less people that need a mixer this size so you'll have less competition if you're on an auction site uh, but the 20 quart mixers are really useless for bread production for a bakery they just can't do enough bread you're talking about 10 kilos of dough maybe 12 kilos of dough that i can fit in there and at that point I might as well be mixing by hand. In fact, I could mix by hand significantly faster than trying to rotate that bowl in and out, in and out. Uh, when it comes to this one, we were getting used to mixing on this one, but it meant that a mixer was basically rotating this bowl out for hours and hours. It took, it took an entire shift to do the work that this one can do in two rounds. Now that I have this auto lease going, uh, I need to make sure that kind of the rest of my life for the next thing that I need to do is set. Uh, since I have some help today, uh, that was pretty easy. Uh, I've got 16 bins, they're already prepped for me. And so by prepped meaning we have uh, lightly brushed them with oil. Um, so that the dough doesn't stick to the actual bin. I mean lightly like there's a gram maybe a, or two of oil in each bin. It's just a couple drops of oil. Uh, and, and that prevents the dough from sticking to the bin when we're doing folds. Um, so these have already been prepped and ready to go. I need at least 20 minutes of an auto lease for any kind of real effect. So 20 minutes is kind of the minimum uh, that we found and that I th if, you, if you Google this, um, you'll probably find that a lot of people agree that 20 minutes is really a baseline to start seeing the effects of the auto lease where the dough starts coming together strong. Right now it's already, see it's, there's this big hole that formed when I try to, when I try to pull it. So that's, that's a sign that it's not all that strong yet. By the end of this 20 minutes, it will be stronger. Although for the start of an auto lease, it's already got a little bit of strength to it. We used to have a lot of setbacks with things and processes, equipment, the bakery itself. For a long time, those type of setbacks really ruled our world. Uh, this place has been a challenge over the course of four years because it's never really quite been adequate for what we we're trying to do at any given moment. And every time we've sort of improved our surroundings, the business was also growing at the time. We were getting more customers. And so, and so we quickly would outgrow the improvements. But we finally, last year when my dad built this extra garage for me on this side, and the year before he built the garage that currently has the oven room in it, we did reach a point where this place started to give us less issues. We reached a point where our equipment and our processes became stable enough that we had some redundancy. When things went wrong, we had more of an ability to recover. So nowadays, typically when I have setbacks, they aren't with processes or with baking, but rather with human interaction. Um, and so baking now is the most grounding thing that I can do. If I have setbacks, then I can simply go back to this because this is something that I know how to do quite well. And so when you know how to do something quite well, 
it can be very comforting. So at this point, the sourdough starter and the salt are right on top of the dough. I have this mixer going again counterclockwise. And notice how quickly the sourdough starter was absorbed. So now I'm changing the directionality of the mixer because in one direction it's very quick to incorporate ingredients and in the other direction the dough hook is stretching the dough and developing the gluten. And so I really like this direction for finishing my mixes uh, because I find the most strength that way. I have one last step in the mix. I'm going to tear these two these two one quarts and then fill them up pretty much fully. It's actually just right. So I'm going to add these two pieces of water into the mixer. Normally I'd probably split this three ways, but we're actually out of these containers now and I I like these containers for this. This is a really good increment of water for this particular size mix. Of course, if you're working on a smaller scale, this has to come down. And just as a reminder, this is the bassinage portion of the mix. So I'm basically adding water at the very end, incorporating a little bit more water in the dough. It softens the dough. It opens up the crumb later on, makes the, the texture a little bit more custardy. Uh, and allows you to get a little bit more hydration in your doughs. So the way that you know that it's time to add the water is you really need to get to a point that the dough is pretty strong. So I'm looking at the dough hook and just watching it grab dough and seeing how strong that dough is that it's grabbing. We're pretty much at a level that I can comfortably add. So there's one. Now this is going to look like the dough is taking a bath for a moment. If you look up close, that's really what I'm seeing is like, it, it very much looks like the dough is kind of taking a bath. But as this develops a little further, you'll notice all this water starts to incorporate and then it'll just return to its strength. That's the moment to add part two. So just that 45 seconds that I was gone is enough that this dough is already looking strong again. And now it's time for that second part. So once this fully develops, my mix is done. It is nice when you have the luxury of a second person doing this because I'll get out of the bowl far faster when I don't have to run back and forth. And that leads to just an interesting tip if you find yourself working in a, any type of a professional kitchen environment where you're, by professional, in this case, I'm just mean you're using a kitchen environment to earn your living. There's moments where, like when I'm on my own doing this, I have to run every bin back and forth because I don't really have enough space for all these bins full. So it's nice to have an extra set of hands where I can just scale, pass, and get right to work. I've got this little thing of water just for my hands so I can have an easier time interacting with the dough. I'll dip my hands frequently here. And out of the bowl, I'm just doing this kind of chopping motion, which, which uh, is not that hard, yes, but, <laughs> but other people that have tried, uh, yeah, it takes a minute to get used to it. I think the challenge is just learning how to interact with the dough um, and getting substantial amounts of dough, also cutting them fast enough. So there's a particular feel to it, but it's not too challenging. I remember the first time when, when I got this mixer, I guess I'd, I hadn't thought much about what it'd be like to use it. It's more like one of those things where I knew a mixer would change our world because other people said so but I didn't quite know how. And so it was intimidating at first to find that this bowl did not move. It was not removable. And so I would be cutting this dough out of here. So at this stage, my sourdough is not 
fully developed, I'm going to save some of that development for stretch and fold. Uh, and as a result, really at no point are we stressing out the dough very much in a mixer. Uh, I don't know if that was something that was noticeable here, but you're only spinning to incorporation for the auto lease, which is only a minute or two. And then once that auto lease happens, you can really fully develop your dough with minimal effort. So I didn't do the best job of scraping the sides this time. There's a little bit of extra, like not really well mixed in uh, remnants on the side. And so if that happens, I mean, I like to just omit those from the dough, this stuff, because if you feel it, it's, it's always got some flour clumps to it if it's stuck to the side of the wall like that. And so I just simply won't include that in the mix. And since I'm going right into a second mix, I will simply try to do better on my next mix. Had I taken an extra moment to spin the bowl the other way, that wouldn't have happened. That's the trade-off. So I don't know if, if you go back, recall when I said that we're mixing very full and so I spun it the other way so that the dough would incorporate into the middle. Uh, well, that's all fine and dandy, but what's happening actually is that that the mixer is pushing the outer parts of the dough out against the bowl. Uh, whereas when you mix it the other way, it's kind of hugging the dough together into a circle. And so what I did by what I should have done, which I'll do on this next mix is just done a final spin the other way to bring it all back in the middle. And I would have avoided all of, all of this because that's probably one whole loaf of bread. If you put that all together, now, against 120, it's not the end of the world. I'm certainly not going to cry over it, but uh, there's always something you can do better. And uh, what's interesting about it is our mixes are designed for full bins, for eight full bins. That is what I needed to round out the bin. So all I'm gonna do now is ask you to mark this by hand. And all that means is that the, uh, the next mix that we do, I, or when we go to, go to scale this, I'm gonna have to just hand scale that. It won't be able to run through our 16 part divider. And we'll see just how much I lost here. But see, I don't really wanna incorporate this because Stretching and folding is not going to make this even. I'll end up with these little clumps in the dough, whereas right now I have perfectly smooth dough. And that's about 600 grams right there, which is exactly what I was short, exactly why that bin is called by hand. I'm putting in the exact same mix again in here, so I'm not gonna worry about doing anything more to this bowl other than this basic scraping of the extra residue. Uh, I will toss this, get reset. We'll do this all again. My water is quite warm and that's primarily because this mixer does not heat up the dough in first speed, the way that it operates. The final goal is to end up with dough that stays in the 80s through scaling, so it keeps moving. I need 5601. So it looks like my teammates already weighed this one out at 22,769. That's a little bit over where it needs to be. So, Jeff, can I have that other white? Oh, you already brought it, cool. Thank you. 
So I have my other dry bucket and I'm simply going to subtract 100 grams from here. Wow, lucky me today. When you use the high quality flour, you can smell the wheat. Uh, it's a beautiful thing about whole grain. White flour doesn't really smell like much, but once you get into whole grain flour, it really has a nice weedy smell. Get that going. Oh. To finish out the auto lease, once this is fully incorporated, I'll go back into spinning the other direction. It'll hug the dough off the sides of the wall, and so then I'll be able to actually get in a little deeper and scrape the, the remnants off the wall. So then when I go to finally, to put the rest of the mix together, that stuff will all incorporate evenly. So now that I'm getting less and less flour dust and more flour clumps, it's getting safer to consider changing directions. For me, just because of how full we're running this mix, I can't really change directions while there's a ton of flour at the very end. So I don't have to worry about it kicking up anymore. And you'll notice how now the dough will come off the walls. Is just make sure that there's nothing on the sides now. So that auto lease is done, checking the time. My first mix is now comfortably in these bins. And I'm gonna wait until the second mix joins them and we'll start folding all 16 bins together. Uh, when it comes to folding, if I fold right now, the dough is quite stretchy, you can see. But when the dough is younger like this, folds don't go as far. So essentially, the dough will go back to its original strength more easily uh, when it's younger. And so later into the mix, meaning more time transpired after the mix, means that my folds will be more effective. So I'm happy to wait for the other mix. So I just added the starter and the salt to the second mix. I'm going to go get it going now and get it to completion. It's only gonna take a little bit and then we'll be done with the mixer for the day. So basically as soon as I no longer am really seeing salt, I'll change the direction of the mixer. So already that's getting close to full incorporation of, those, of the starter. And it's only gonna be maybe another minute or so before I can start thinking about the bassinage. Let's see how, yeah, I feel like as I get older, a minute goes faster than when I was a kid. Anybody else feel that way? It's not every day that I'm negotiating with the city or dealing with a neighbor or trying to put together a new bakery, but it is every day that we are mixing bread. And um, the exciting things like building a new bakery are overwhelmingly positive, but they come with side effects too. There's days where things don't go your way. There's days where you might come into a whole new delay or problem in that. And it's really nice to be able to come back in here and just do something that feels really tangible and real. It's part of what attracted me to baking in the first place, to baking bread, something, something that's staple to all of human history. It was one of the first times that I did something that you know, I could go to my parents and or my grandparents, which are are no longer with me, but you know, anyone that I've ever known in my life can understand the concept of making bread. Whereas working on a computer, not so much. So it's it's nice. It's it's nice in that sense. It's part of what makes this this uh, a special thing to be able to do. I'm I for one really believe in that. Being able to do things that are historically normal is, is a really great joy. 
you know, we've, as a society, overwhelmingly been robbed of being able to do this at the community level because we've chosen to buy industrial bread. I'm not trying to say that industrial bread shouldn't exist. All I'm trying to say is that this type of bread should exist more. Uh, and it sounds like that's what's happening. Well, we're buying mixers from ABS for our new bakery. So I was calling them the other day, ordering uh, our mixers for our new bakery. And they were telling me that apparently ever since we put that video up of the deck oven, a number of people have been ordering ovens like that going into garages around the country. Uh, the company said that they've been shipping out 15 deck ovens a month to garages around the country. So it seems like you guys get this idea of trying to start a bakery from your garage. God help you. It's exciting and challenging, um, but but I think it's overwhelmingly positive that's happening. That That's something I've been thinking about ever since that happened, that for whatever reason, a number of people are taking video content here and actually taking the next step and becoming bakers at home at a scale that can serve their communities. And I can't think of a better thing than that uh, in terms of bread production in, at the community level. Uh, and to those of you that are in that boat, it's going to be a little bit of a long road and learning curve, but this whole thing has changed our life. It's changed our life fundamentally. It's changed all the people in our lives. Um, and, and it's been overwhelmingly positive. This particular year has been filled with challenges, but also been filled with the opportunity to overcome those challenges. So hopefully a year from now, our life will be much more centric on these grounded activities of making bread and far less centric around this idea of having to build a new bakery from, from the ground up again. Because that is overwhelmingly exhausting at the end of the day. Really, I just want to make good bread for the community. I want to get back to the, the making of bread, the watching of people's reactions to the bread, the speaking into people's lives with good food as a whole. Uh, and that's the benefit of doing this. Uh, you know, we didn't always have this thing streamlined. In fact, still the majority of the time that we've been doing this were sleepless Friday nights, where Friday really just rolled right into Saturday and we didn't sleep till after market. Over time, we got better and better and better to where sleep is possible again. And But still, what was motivating back then is still motivating today, and that's getting to see the memories that are forming with with the folks that are buying our bread week in and week out, uh, being at the market or being at our store and seeing familiar faces. When, when you get to see people like once a week or once a month or once every four months, there's a beautiful like check-in process that happens in those relationships that I, I have very much come to value. Uh, it brings you back to the last time that you were with that person and allows you to sort of reflect on all the things that have changed in your life since the last time that you encountered that person. When it's your customer, you sort of share that journey with them. They're on the receiving end of your work and it's a beautiful relationship that forms when people get to kind of see the changes and support you through all the various changes. Our bread has only gotten better. Our processes have certain change, certainly changed, but the reaction that people have to it is growing in depth with every season. So people are, people get attached to, to food uh, in a meaningful way and it becomes a part of their lives, it becomes a part of their history. I mean, certainly that was my experience. Proof bread was such an important part of my weekly ritual that when it was about to go away, I had to actually take over the brand and make sure that it stayed alive. So food has a really powerful way of impacting people and that has been a really powerful motivator for me to keep going uh, when, when I'm tired even of baking itself. So there's multiple layers of motivation. If life hits you hard, then doing something as grounding as uh, doing something that you're good at is very reassuring and helpful. But if that reassuring 
thing is no longer reassuring, if you're just that exhausted, then you can go to the next level and see how your work is impacting others. In this sense, there's 120 loaves of bread in this mixer right now. Each of those loaves of bread has 15 slices to it. And so there's, what is that, around 2,000 meals that, that can be formed out of just this one bowl? That's 2,000 individual experiences. Now we've done that twofold today, so that's 4,000 meals. Meanwhile, Adelia's working on croissants over there, and each of those has 60 or so croissants times seven. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of memories attached to our bread every week. And so if you're lacking motivation, if you're lacking encouragement, if you're lacking confidence, you have this great community of people that is that is right there with you enjoying the fruit of your work. That's not my situation today. I'm quite content with just making bread today, but there are ups and downs in all of this. And this is not, you know, I'm, I'm in a little bit of a, a slump this week, but it's certainly not the lowest of lows. You can certainly get lower than this. Uh, and it's not the highest of highs either. So today it's just good enough to be making bread. And then other times there have to be other types of fuel that, that helps you get through it. Because at the end of the day, what separates the people that make it and the people that don't is just simply overcoming obstacle after obstacle, including your own self-imposed obstacles, which admittedly are most of them. Most of the obstacles that we face are just like in my, in my head half the time. You break down like, men and I have this conversation all the time. So right now we're going through a challenging season financially. I, I hope that that's easy to relate to. We're spending close to a half a million dollars on our new bakery. Much of that we don't have and we're borrowing. Some of that has been generously um, donated to us from this community, uh, nearly 20%. Um, and, but yet, you know, we've never faced such a financial challenge. So it's easy to get overwhelmed just with your own with your own stress. And it, I think what I found is important is to match that up to reality. Are we still paying the bills? Are we still paying our employees? Are we still paying ourselves? So far, the answer to that question has been yes. Um, so most of the stress that we feel financially is a mental construct, is, oh, I can't believe this or that is happening. I can't believe I'm, I have this on my plate. And that it really boils down to those words. I can't believe it. I can't mentally wrap my mind around it. So thus I'm going to be stressed about it. And I find that those type of stressors are actually quite unnecessary. You can overcome those simply, simply by thinking about them, by having some strong support, which I'm still learning how to do. Uh, I think after a week, like last week for me, one of the struggles is I am constantly surrounded now by work, even by the people that I engage with that don't work for me. Everybody really wants to know what's going on. So all I want to do is make bread and then sort of retreat this week. Um, and I can't wait to get back it later on this morning. Um, it's probably, you guys might see it separated from this particular clip, but the garden has been a really important hobby for me started about a year ago uh, and we have fruit trees all over now of 45 or so really young fruit trees but now they're starting their second growing season uh, and that has just been a place of refuge for me uh, because the trees don't question me about business which you know business can be overwhelming when so much is going on. You, you need to take a break so that you can sort of reset and keep going, especially when there's a lot going on on your plate. Uh, so for me, that's been gardening.